Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ideas Liberalism Conference of 2021. This is the second session uh, of the conference, which deals on politics and it's entitled The Rise of State Intervention in Weathering the Economics of COVID-19. Before we begin the sessions, allow me just to make some housekeeping announcements. At the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs in Malaysia, we are committed to provide a safe environment for all parties, both internal and external, to work together. IDEAS has a policy of zero tolerance towards sexual exploitation and abused. Everyone here today is responsible for making this event a safe space for a public discourse. Once again, on behalf of Ideas Malaysia, we'd like to welcome all panelists, distinguished, distinguished speakers, as well as our participants and friends who will be listening as um, this afternoon. I would like to introduce to you the moderator of the session today, Ms. Ira Azhari from Ideas. Over to you, Ira. Thank you, Zokri. Good afternoon uh, to all our participants, attendees today on Zoom and also on Facebook. Thank you very much for once again joining us uh, for Ideas Liberalism Conference 2021. So this is the first uh, panel session actually uh, for the whole uh, weekend, uh, the first out of three. Um, and this first panel will be on Malaysia Post 2018, the breakdown of trust and fragility of parliamentary democracy. So we have uh, two hours for this session. Um, I will dedicate the first hour to our three uh, very distinguished speakers before we then go uh, to the Q&A uh, in the second hour. And uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the Q&A box or if you're tuning in on Facebook in the comment section, uh, and I will try my best to uh, take uh, all of your questions uh, this afternoon. So my name is Ira Azhari. I'm the uh, manager of the Democracy and Governance Unit at IDEAS. And uh, today's topic, um, when we were framing this topic uh, for this afternoon, we had in mind the loss of faith that many Malaysians have felt in elections and also parliamentary democracy since the Sheraton move in February last year. And how this is reflective or, or is it not reflective of the erosion of trust in democracy, politics and institutions across the world today. Our liberalism conference is usually a chance for us to explore issues at a more philosophical level and also a chance to bring in um, global, global perspectives into the discourse as well. So we are joined by three esteemed, esteemed speakers today, Dr. Amrita Malhi, Dr. Sebastian Detman, and also Dr. Sophie Lemaire. Um, the first uh, panelist that I will invite uh, for this afternoon is Dr. Amrita Malhi. She is the visiting fellow at the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs at the Australian National University in Canberra. She's joining us from all the way in, from Canberra uh, this afternoon. Uh, she's a historian of Southeast Asia with a primary interest in Islam, shifting identities and identity conflicts in Kulu colonial Malaya and contemporary Malaysia. Dr. Amrita, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. Please go ahead. Oh, well, thank you so much. I hope everything's working. I didn't actually um, check just now, but anyway, I, I trust that it is. Now, thank you so much for having me, Ira, and ideas. Um, you know, it's, a, it's always a pleasure. It's my second talk with you guys um, this year, and you know, it's just fun. So thanks for having me. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit about the issue of social cohesion. Um, you know, given that we are, you know, here on a panel that's covering the theme of trust, um, I, you know, I, I want to cover this topic because it's a term that's that's more and more current in academic discussions, um, along with older ones that very often are applied to Malaysia. You know, terms like plural society or or even divided society, which is one that you know, really um, it raises a few alarm bells in my head whenever I hear it. But but terms like this are bandied around very freely in relation to Malaysia. And, and very often in these discussions, you get this uh, notion that um, this thing called social cohesion is, is, is the solution. So I, I, I want to sort of address that a little bit today. And, and before I get to Malaysia, let me start at a more general level, um, that of, I guess, you know, the region of Southeast Asia, of Asia in general, uh, and with the general concept of social cohesion. Now, I've been on this track a little bit um, since I had a commission to do a project uh, to perform some interviews a couple of years ago, um, you know, just at the kind of the tail end of the Pakatan Harapan government before Sheraton. Um, and I've been thinking about the issue ever since. 
Um, and and it, it came up again very recently because I uh, I recently heard an observer of Southeast Asia um, express, I guess, an equal measure of surprise and relief um, that social cohesion hasn't broken down very seriously across um, the entire region. Um, uh, and, and they said in the context of that uh, conversation that we were having that essentially it was fortunate that people's trust in each other and in governments and institutions in general hadn't collapsed entirely given all the factors that should, uh, you know, at least in theory, be causing them to collapse. So there's the pandemic, of course, there's a health and economic crisis that have triggered. There's the general trend of democratic backsliding. There's the specific context of Malaysia and the intense political competition that's been going on. Uh, for a while now likely to lead to another state election, which I don't want to get into because it's, you know, it's too hard, too many things to cover. So, you know, in the context of that discussion, I mean, you know, I've got to say, I didn't really reply. I, I don't actually know what to make of that. Um, I mean, I'm glad the person was um, uh, was happy that things weren't worse. Uh, but I guess I, you know, in general, I'm not sure that it's possible to create a general rule um, that explains what makes a society cohesive or otherwise, and nor am I that sure that there are meaningful ways to measure whether social cohesion exists or whether it's breaking down or staying steady or getting better or what. Um, although I know that there are tools out there that try to do this. Now, one of these tools is called the social cohesion radar, uh, which essentially defines social cohesion as, and I quote, the quality of social cooperation and togetherness in a territorially defined community. So basically a nation state. Um, and now this definition goes directly to the issue we're discussing uh, today on the panel, which is uh, social trust after the Sheraton move and, and so on. And now I've got to admit I'm a bit suspicious, you know, given the use of terms like togetherness, uh, I'm not sure really how many, uh, how any such indices could possibly account for whether the cohesion that they claim to measure, to be measuring, uh, actually reflects a genuine shared understanding uh, of public or civic citizenship, or perhaps it actually reflects something more coercive, something more authoritarian, something that's been sort of beaten together, you know, in a way that is not necessarily all that consensual. Um, so, you know, I've, I've got a few problems with the idea, but, you know, at the same time, I should say that even studies based on such indices acknowledge the problems that I'm talking about. Uh, and I quote from a foreword to one such study came out in 2019, there is no silver bullet that leads to consistently strong social cohesion. Rather, different constellations and factors contribute to a more or less cohesive society. Given considerable diversity across Southeast Asia, of course, countries have to develop their own strategies and measures for strengthening or maintaining social cohesion. And now further, according to the researchers who published the study, uh, Aurel Croissant and Peter Walkenhorst, uh, the very idea of social cohesion can be Janus faced, i.e. it has two faces, uh, because, and I quote, on the one hand, it can function as the glue that holds society together, allowing for economic progress and an inclusive development policy. On the other hand, social cohesion can serve as a foundation for authoritarian political systems in the sense that, of course, you know, if you, uh, if people are cohered together as opposed to cohere together, um, you know, that can be quite effective in, in holding the system together. Now, the researchers in question did not look at Malaysia in their 2019 study, and that's that's fine. I, I will look at Malaysia instead. Uh, and, and of course, in Malaysia, there's been, you know, a serious health and economic toll taken by COVID-19. And, um, you know, even in the keynote earlier, you know, DS Nazir talked about um, the political disillusionment that's been pretty obvious uh, across Malaysian society, not just among those who were disappointed by the collapse of Pakatan Harapan, but, but I think there's a general disillusionment and a cynicism um, after events. And I don't just mean after the Sheraton uh, move, but you know, even since 2018, not everybody was happy with the 2018 result. It, there was a divided reaction, but also even before that, back to 2015, when the 1MDB scandal began to break, and just how much, you know, how much discussion that triggered and how much uh, soul searching, I guess, uh, that triggered. Uh, and now for me, jumping back to this year, one of the key moments that really brought home to me just how much frustration there is around uh, in Malaysian society today is a video that aired in July this year when Kini TV aired online an interview with Dato Amir Ali Maidin, who is both the managing director of the Maidin hypermarket chain uh, and vice president of the Malaysian Retail Association. I think he's also president of the Bumiputra Retailers Organization, actually. So that's three things that he's um, uh, in charge of. Now, in the interview, uh, Dr. Amir was almost in tears as he told his audience that on the one hand, owing to the impact of pandemic control measures on the public, there is more theft than ever taking place in his stores. And yet, on the other hand, and also owing to the impact of the pandemic control measures, 
Shoplifters are no longer stealing high value items that they can sell, like speakers and televisions. Uh, instead, they're stealing basic nutritional staples like fish and veggies, while at the same time, they're buying more instant noodles than, than ever before. Uh, and it's because, you know, basically Maggie Mee is the cheapest of the cheap stomach fillers. Um, and, and, you know, he was practically sobbing when, when he was talking about it. It's sad, he told the audience, um, you know, practically in tears. Now, soon afterwards, uh, you can see I watch a lot of videos online, but I watched another video uh, that really stuck with me as well, uh, which was, you know, it basically had uh, Mahathir's former economics advisor, Muhammad Abdul Khalid, saying in exasperation on Astro Awani in an interview that he was doing, that Malaysia has lost its middle class. There are no more savings, he said, not for asset accumulation, not for investing in education. Uh, and in fact, many people have cleaned out their EPF funds as well to get the money that they've needed to survive through, you know, the economic uh, basically shut down. Now, in the keynote earlier, we also heard D.S. Nazir Razak talk about the policy intervention, intervention that his father, Thun Razak, led after 1969, which included launching the NEP, the New Economic Policy, in 1971 in the second Malaysia plan. Now, the NEP, as we all know, has just celebrated its 50th birthday, uh, and there's been quite a discussion about it, given that its anniversary has fallen in the middle of a pandemic that has basically broken down its growth model. Now, whether it can be built up again in terms of delivering national growth at the aggregate level, that's a question that I will leave to others. Uh, and there's a panel tomorrow, I believe, that will have you know, qualified people to, to talk about that sort of thing. Uh, but the point I want to discuss in relation to our topic, which is trust, is how the connection between growth, redistribution, and social cohesion works. Now, I'll be the first to say I don't exactly know. I'm thinking about it, testing out arguments, and so on. Uh, I wrote something in The Diplomat earlier this year uh, about the middle class, and there's something else in a report on New Mandala too. So I'm just working with these ingredients, you know, trying to, trying to make something of them. Now, let me just discuss the NEP uh, just briefly. Now, remember that the NEP was aimed at addressing poverty while, and I quote, restructuring Malaysian society to correct economic imbalance, to reduce and eventually eliminate the identification of race with economic function. Now, critical to this effort was the modernization of rural life while also growing the urban economy and creating a Malay commercial and industrial community. So in short, the aim was to create a Malay Muslim middle class. And it would also, while it was doing this, pursue a vision of national unity, um, which is the Malaysian version of the word social cohesion, pretty much. It's the preferred term in the Malaysian context, but it would pursue a, a vision of national unity around a shared culture and language, and perhaps more importantly, a shared experience of rapid economic growth. Now, through this growth and the economic restructuring that the NEP would perform in the background of the growth, um, it was going to do two things. It was going to generate growth for everyone. It was going to redistribute um, you know, to, to eliminate the, the function of, of, of race in the economy, and it would produce what we now call social cohesion. Now, in the rural economy dominated by Malay Muslims at the time, whose grievances it had argued that the communists in the 60s were exploiting, the Malaysian government rolled out a program of agricultural research, strengthening rural institutions, you know, producing more irrigation, more fertilizers, more double cropping, more intercropping, you know, all kinds of like crop-based interventions to, to increase rural wealth. Uh, there were all sorts of other interventions like hard and soft infrastructure, roads, telecommunications, electricity, hospitals, housing, credit uh, institutions for smallholders, uh, and you know certain areas like the East Coast, which were not growing as quickly as the West Coast and the cities, were going to be afforded extra attention. Now, through these initiatives and the many others set out in the Second Malaysia Plan, the Malaysian government began to lay down the institutions of the development of state that so shaped Malaysian public life today and still shape it, especially in the context of a downturn where the state has been essentially running the economy on life support, um, you know, for the last two years. Um, so, you know, this is the, the context in which uh, the institutions that we are living with right now were created uh, with the aim of rapidly developing the nation so that everybody could leave the grievances of the 1960s in the past. Um, and now the other aim, or the other outcome anyway, uh, was to bind society more closely to the state, especially that part of society that is the majority Malay Muslim bloc, or it was kind of blockified, you know, at the time, because the bloc doesn't just produce itself, it's not natural, it's got to be produced by these interventions. Um, but it was, you know, essentially the part of the aim was to bind that bloc to the state, to keep it away from some of that rural ag agitation, some of that, you know, class struggle, um, you know, type stuff that was going on in the smaller towns and in the countryside. 
uh, and essentially use that group um, to serve as a bulwark for UMNO and UMNO politics and against any attempts to move UMNO off the stage. Now, this is, you know, a really important point that, you know, the, the thing that the second Malaysia plan demonstrated was that Malaysian elites efforts to transform the nation through accelerated development since the 1970s have been informed by their experience of the 1960s, which they viewed as a period of acute danger to their authority and to their position. Now, it was not only 1969, which is the one we always hear about, 1969, the, the election result and the resulting violence, but, you know, as I mentioned just now, it was also the agrarian unrest of the 1960s, the possibility of a serious challenge, um, a communist movement that might have been rebuilding, or the government thought so at the time anyway, uh, and of course, on top of that, the, the election and the violence of 1969. Now, let me finish by getting back to today. Uh, the growth that the NEP delivered and the cushion that that growth provided to help protect Malaysians' resilience in the face of rising racial and religious rhetoric has stalled. At one point, it was looking so bad that there was even a rather specious argument about whether Malaysia is a failed state. Now, of course, it's not a failed state, but there is a certain process of, I guess, social, institutional, economic decomposition that seems to be going on. Uh, and it seems to me that the emergency was a clear sign that the nation's political elite, elite couldn't explain it, had no proposals for dealing with it, and all they could do was try to ensure that they would not be challenged while they furiously worked in the background to pull the situation together if they could. And even that was not certain. Um, I don't know if it, even know if it's certain now, but all the same, certainly those efforts are in place and there's you know, some level of um, improvement. Certainly the vaccination rollout you know, began to work and, and hopefully things are going to be on track uh, with that. Um, but at the same time as all of this, if we look back at the campaigns based on racial and religious rhetoric that brought down the government that was elected in 2018, it's very likely that there are sections of the Malaysian political class that are learning for pretty much the millionth time in Malaysian history that anti-Chinese and anti-liberal wedge politics really work. They are so effective that they can cause governments to topple themselves, not even be toppled, but topple themselves, driven by the fear of not being able to cope with the pressure that those campaigns create. Now, the anti isod campaign, by the way, did not only stop Malaysia from ratifying ISERD, uh, it, they also caused the government to abandon three bills that were first drafted during Najib Razak's prime ministership uh, and were then considered again by Pakatan Harapan. Uh, and these were the Racial and Religious Hate Crimes Bill, the National Harmony and Reconciliation Bill, and a National Harmony and Reconciliation Commission Bill. Uh, I've got a report on these things up on New Mandala online, so if anyone wants to read it, it's there. Um, but anyway, the main point to, uh, to make now is that after the Sheraton uh, event, uh, those bills have been dumped and the present government uh, and the one that intervened in between Sheraton and, and the present government um, decided to invest in a new campaign to get Malaysians behind the Rukun Negara. So basically to go back again to um, you know, a 1970, 1971 uh, model for talking about national unity uh, and social cohesion, which was the, the Rukun Negara. Now, there were problems with those bills, and, and you can read about that uh, you know, in, in the report I wrote, uh, but the quick summary is that while they might sound more democratic than SOSMA, the Penal Code, the Sedition Act, ultimately the institutions they would have built could just as easily have been captured by majoritarian forces and directed against minorities and liberals instead of you know, protecting them. And, and in that sense, they, they wouldn't have been unique. It would have been just like any other institution of the Malaysian state. They always had the potential to be captured in that way. Uh, and yet at the same time, in principle at least, it was also conceivable that, for example, if a National Harmony Commission was created, that it could be used to slow down, or at least to some extent to help to disincentivize the usefulness of racial and religious outbidding. And yet even so, they could not exist because those very campaigns built on racial and religious outbidding prevented them from happening. And this is, I think, you know, just the, the essential problem of, you know, any kind of reform proposal in Malaysia is that, you know, if it's directed at reducing the effectiveness of racial and religious outbidding, it will be stopped by racial and religious outbidding. Uh, and so, you know, you could have watched at the time, it was absolutely clear that, you know, the campaigns that brought down those bills were out of the regular playbook. You know, the, the outbidding playbook that I've observed, certainly for my entire lifetime, uh, which is, you know, you make a statement, you create a media cycle in which a lot of scandalized people come out and condemn the statement, then you walk the statement back 50%, 75%, and then you end up with a new compromise. But actually, what you've done is you've pushed the limit that much further uh, as a result, you know, further towards, let's say, for argument's sake, more Islamization, more state intervention in managing people's identities, managing the boundaries between people's identities, uh, and essentially more active involvement by more majoritarian forces 
in creating and recreating that required majority. You know, without without a majority to, to work on, uh, the stuff doesn't work. So they've got to keep on producing that majority. And so now if you watch the campaign about the whiskey that's going on, Bima, you can observe it following exactly the same process because, because that is the playbook. And yet right now, there seems to be a difference between, let's say, you know, in the early 90s, uh, which is that today's outbidding is taking place in a context in which there is actually an active discussion about whether Malaysia's middle class, so famously built by the NEP, has actually collapsed. You know, could it be that everything that was done uh, to build a cushion has actually now, uh, you know, irreversibly collapsed? I don't know if it's irreversible or not, as I said, but it's sure looking pretty shaky. And yet, as I mentioned before, the experience of the 60s and of the NEP have left an indelible imprint, not only on Malaysian governments, but actually on all Malaysians. We've all grown up inside, you know, um, that imprint. But ultimately, strong economic growth and strong pro-Malay Muslim economic restructuring are essential to protecting social cohesion in the Malaysian context, and there's no way around it. So for me, the questions are basically, how will Malaysia get that experience back? Where will that growth come from? And very importantly, is growth the cushion that supports Malaysians' resilience so they don't snap in the face of all the outbidding and the exclusion that it creates? And if so, if it really is the cushion, is it going to be possible to re reinflate the cushion uh, that that growth provides? And who is going to finance that growth? Where is it going to come from? Now, these are very difficult questions, and they may require some honest discussions about what to do about anti-Chinese domestic politics and also anti-liberal domestic politics, which really are about maintaining the boundary, you know, between who's on who's on the side of Islam and Malayness and who's not, including Malays, who can be rejected and pushed out of that majority group, um, you know, from time to time as it serves um, those forces. So I guess my question is, is the future of Malaysian politics to be found in more and more and more racial and religious outbidding? Or can it change to become something more inclusive? Now, as I've already said, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. So I'll leave it there. I'll pose the question and perhaps we can talk about it in the panel. So thank you again for, for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amrita Malhi. Brilliant, um, brilliant uh, sharing of your the, the the research work that you've done, and I have read your report uh, for New Mandala, and uh, we can go back to some of these points during this the, the discussion, of course. Um, you know, and you mentioned about this uh, this current hoo-ha about this whiskey bottle issue. Um, the sanitary pad one also comes into mind, uh, which I thought was just really, really unfortunate. So we can go into some of these um, during the discussion session. Definitely, I would like to pick some, pick up some of these points again. Um, but for now, we'll go to our second panelist, uh, Dr. Sebastian Detman. So Dr. Sebastian is an assistant professor of political science at the Singapore Management University. He specializes in democratization, political parties and elections, as well as political participation. So Dr. Sebastian Detman, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. Um, yes, please go ahead. Great, thank you, Ira. Let me just set up my presentation here. Okay, everyone can see um, my screen now, I hope. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So yeah. um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining and, and thanks to Ideas for the invitation to speak with you um, today. So. Um, following on, on some of Dr. Mahi's really interesting and, and thought-provoking comments, I'm going to share a couple of thoughts um, about recent events in, in Malaysia um, and in the spirit of the, the sort of wide-ranging subject matter of this, of this conference to talk uh, not only about Malaysia, but try to put some of Malaysia's recent experiences into a broader comparative uh, perspective. So um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about specific technical fixes or institutional reforms, but um, which of course we can discuss later, but I think it might be helpful to think about sort of a, a, a put Malaysia within a broader context um, and, and what we're seeing in Malaysia today. So I offer this perspective basically as an outsider observer of Malaysia, but also someone who's interested in, in thinking about concepts of democracy, liberal democracy, and, and where we find ourselves in this, in this global um, context. So I just want to start with a, a broad overview, which I think you know was mentioned a bit in the, uh, this morning with the, the introductory panels. But I think it's worth considering where we are in terms of thinking about the, the concept of democracy and liberal democracy. And um, as many of you already know, there's already a very clear worldwide trend of democratic backsliding. Um, and scholars and observers have generally pointed uh, basically around 2005, 2006 was like the high water mark for uh, for democracy in the world. And over the past 15 years, as you can see by this Freedom House quote, there's basically been consecutive years of democratic decline 
um, globally. So even though I think we are very concerned about democratic backsliding under COVID, and this is obviously a very hot topic to think about, um, even prior to COVID, there's been worry about what direction um, the world is, is going into, and uh, the world is going in terms of uh, democracy and, and regime type. And just to echo, actually, uh, Dr. Sri Nazir this morning mentioned uh, Larry Diamond. And you know, there's been a lot of interesting research about what are the sources of democratic recession or democratic regression around the world. And there's a number of factors, which I won't discuss here, but um, clearly there, there are sort of multiple challenges to, uh, seemingly multiple challenges to the model of liberal democracy, which um, we have so far taken maybe for granted as the predominant form or uh, you know, predominant form of government that we will see around the world. Um, okay, so first, I just want to um, actually again put our put the um, context into Southeast Asia. So drilling down a bit, um, if we turn to Southeast Asia as a whole, um, things are also not looking that great for the state of democracy. Um, as a whole, the the region of of uh, Southeast Asia remains pretty resistant to democratization, with a couple of exceptions. Indonesia and East Timor generally score quite highly on democratic indices. Um, other countries in Malaysia, or sorry, in Southeast Asia, have experienced kind of fluctuation over time. So, even though there's been democratic advances in a number of countries in Southeast Asia, um, and including Malaysia. Um, we've seen, uh, not only have we seen democratic backsliding more recently, um, but uh, these, these trends are, are, uh, are indicative of a larger trend within the region, which suggests that Southeast Asia so far has not been hit by a wave of democracy. So, uh, you know, another thing that I think is probably important to consider um, is that, you know, for, for these international indices of democracy, which try to um, encapsulate all countries in the world and try to measure them all by the same standard uh, in terms of things like free and fair elections, freedom of expression, freedom of association, Malaysia still is considered a hybrid regime. In other words, it combines elements of a democratic regime with some elements of a non-democratic regime. So I think it's probably important to keep that context when we're thinking about how we understand um, Malaysia. And I know that you know when we think about the popular discourse, about democracy in, in Malaysia and democratic institutions, um, I, I think it's helpful to think that on, from a global perspective, um, even though there have been advances in Malaysia's uh, politics and, and, and democratic rights in recent years, um, it still has not broken through, at least if we take these indicators as, as um, showing us something, uh, Malaysia is still not broken through to the realm of electoral democracies, okay? so. When we're thinking about Malaysia in particular, all of you are very familiar with what's happened uh, post Sheraton. So I'm not gonna spend too much time uh, on this topic, but I think we can probably agree that there's been some level of democratic regression or regression of political rights and civil liberties in Malaysia over the past two years or so. Um, so um, again, these events are very familiar to all of you, but I think it's, it's probably important to remember that uh, you know, we've had a successive or Malaysia has had successive governments and prime ministers serving without a clear electoral mandate or vote of confidence in parliament. Um, we've had parliamentary institutions um, basically either restricted for reasons of COVID, suspended during the emergency, and then also circumvented um, through other forms of guaranteeing support. So, um, you know, of course, the, the method by which the past two prime ministers were, were appointed did not rely on parliament or a majority of parliament expressing their public view of their vote of confidence or no confidence in the government, but rather through the, the, the king. So um, I think this shows that parliamentary supremacy in politics is, is not established in Malaysia. And, um, and uh, these I think were significant challenges to, uh, to parliamentary supremacy in that context. Um, and then of course, we still have these, these ongoing restrictions on free expression, free association. Um, and I think finally, potentially damaging legacies of these, this kind of emergency style politics. Um, so, so far, I think in the, the post-emergency period, I think there have been some encouraging signs and I don't wanna paint too grim a picture, um, at least from my outside perspective, but uh, I do think, um, uh, you know, this, this kind of emergency style politics where institutions are circumvented for what are seen as either political expediency or 
in times of economic and political crisis, I think potentially lays some um, uh, some dangerous precedents, perhaps, for governing in the future. Um, so, uh, does this show that you know electoral democracy is dead in in Malaysia, and um, you know uh, things are you know it's a terrible and grim situation? I don't think it does. In fact, I think there are some uh, you know again thinking about Malaysia comparatively, actually some pretty clear signs of um, I would say hope and and optimism when we're thinking about how how um, institutions, political and civil uh, institutions can function in the country. So um, a couple, uh, sort of a broad, again, going back to this kind of broad uh, perspective, um, you know, I think it's important to note that Malaysia is not the only country in the world which has experienced some of these types of similar dynamics, right? Um, we've had, or Malaysia has had at the end of a very long period of dominant party, dominant coalition rule, um, there have been a number of countries which have unseated those, those coalitions. And, um, and I think it's kind of worth considering what the tra trajectory of politics in those countries um, looks like. So first, I think it's important to note that um, electoral transitions of power are not necessarily the be all end all of democratization. In other words, uh, there, this is not the only way through which democracy is, is coming to power. And I think, you know, quite rightly, um, I think it's important to remember that um, there's a term which is used sometimes in political science, which is a protracted transition. So rather than seeing um, increased electoral competition in Malaysia from the perspective of, uh, you know, that Malaysia has now entered a new uh, realm, and in some ways it has, but um, I think we can consider this as part of a larger process, which will take um, years and perhaps decades to actually unfold. So when we're looking at politics now just three years after there was a transition of power, I think it's probably important to remember um, that this is uh, that this is a longer term process in many countries which have experienced the similar um, dynamic. Another thing to note here is, is that you know former ruling parties and ruling coalitions tend to remain important players in politics. So um, I think, uh, when we're thinking about the, the resiliency of the former government as a enduring player in politics in Malaysia, um, and of course their, their place in the current government, um, I think it's important to remember that this is by itself is not necessarily a, uh, a bad thing. In fact, I think this can be considered a healthy sign of politics where um, you have uh, you know, still interests and, and uh, perspectives which are still represented by the ruling party, the former ruling party, which are now represented in, in sort of the new normal of, of politics after that electoral defeat. Um, but I think it's also important to remember is um, how these former ruling parties or ruling governments adapt to new circumstances are important. And, um, you know, um, uh, Dr. Mahi was just mentioning previously about, you know, the, the ICER debates and, and sort of the weaponization of racial and religious politics. Uh, I think that is perhaps one warning sign about how um, how politics is, is being played in this transitional period. So, um, you know, again, taking as an outsider, as a non-Malaysian, my perspective is not so much about who is in power and who is not, but from the perspective of uh, of thinking about democratization and democracy, it's about whether those players play by the rules of the game, They're using democracy in the ways that. Um, we expect them to, right? If they lose power, they try to win power again through an electoral process. Um, and then finally, another point here is that um, uh, I don't know what the perspective of Malaysians on the ground is of, for example, the recent memorandum of understanding between the, the Pakatan Harapan and the government. And of course, we can talk about that more and I'll, I'll mention it in just a bit. But I think it's also important to remember that um, this type of opposition and engagement in terms of bargaining and negotiation, sometimes unlikely alliances of power, um, actually have been key in a number of countries in extracting political concessions and reforms from ruling governments. So in countries like Mexico and Taiwan, having opposition parties which were presenting a threat to the government actually became an important bargaining chip in, in, uh, in enacting types of reforms, whether they're electoral reforms, um, specifically electoral reforms were, were a pretty key aspect of that. So um, uh, again, I think it's helpful to think that this is not a process unique to Malaysia um, and that, that this is often a longer, more uh, protracted process.
Okay, so just a couple comments about the, the current political situation in, in Malaysia. So thinking back to the sort of uh, theme of this panel, which is about parliamentary democracy and its fragility, um, I would argue that, yes, we have seen a fair amount of fragi fragility in institutions in Malaysia recently, but I do think it's a positive trajectory in the short term and almost certainly in the longer term. And, you know, uh, political scientists are notoriously bad at making predictions. So uh, this is just my two cents, uh, again, for on, these, on, these, um, on these issues. But um, on the one hand, we do see uh, this continuing instability, which seems to have uh, been reduced in the near term with the MOU. Um, but we still see this kind of unstable new equilibrium where you have um, politicians and parties and coalitions changing. You have thin parliamentary majorities where there used to be this kind of commanding majority in parliament. Um, and it introduces a totally new dynamic to Malaysian politics after many years of, of political stability um, and, and sort of almost stasis of politics at the national level. Um, I would argue that this is actually not necessarily a bad thing because political actors are trying to readjust themselves in a new environment. Um, we've seen this kind of fragmentation taking place in Malaysia, but I would I would say that that's uh, that's uh, is going to be inevitably part of the process as as people figure out political elites, especially try to figure out where they're going to put their uh, their where the, how they're going to position themselves basically. Um, and importantly, I think there's still some pretty clear divisions between parties and coalitions. So obviously, we've seen some fragmentation of parties some factionalism, which has led to new parties and new party factions and so on. But I think it's still pretty clear to the average person, maybe some of the differences, ideological or policy goals between Perikata Nacional and Pakatan Harapan. And I think that's important from the perspective of accountability, right? So who knows how the Malacca state elections will go or the next national election, but I think voters still have some uh, clear um, differences that they can vote for, right? It may not be the ideal situation for some in, in Malaysian society, but nevertheless, there are some other countries which have experienced this complete fragmentation where it becomes almost impossible to decide, okay, what's the difference between voting for the opposition and the ruling party? And I think we still see some pretty clear differences between um, parties and coalitions in Malaysia. Um, and finally, and something I'll talk about a bit more, is that reforms are now, importantly, I think, part of this currency of bargaining between the opposition and government. And I think that's a really positive sign um, for Malaysian politics and thinking about from the perspective of, of reform um, going forward. So let me just briefly offer a couple of thoughts about the MOU. And, and if you know people are interested in the subject, we could maybe discuss it more um, in the Q&A. You know, obviously, it's now just a month old. This agreement between Pakatan Harapan and the government, and I, I, I would argue again from my perspective that I think this is actually a useful starting point, um, especially for things like parliamentary reform. So, what I think is heartening about looking at the MOU is that there's some very specific, actionable things that can be done by the government, um, it being asked by the opposition. Um, that are not going to fundamentally rewrite the balance of politics in Malaysia. They're not, they're not um, necessarily earth shattering in their effects, but I think actually paint the way towards, or pave the way rather, towards a more um, equitable style of politics within um, the, the government. So, um, you know, the, I think there have been criticisms of the MOU and about whether or not it's, it goes far enough, right? And I think if we talked about some of the other specific provisions of the MOU, one could argue that these are not, uh, maybe weren't asking enough, right? They weren't putting enough on the table in exchange for support. Um, and one other criticism that might be leveled against this MOU is that, you know, does it prioritize a consensus view of politics over what should be kind of productive confrontation? So um, again, going back to what I was saying about the divisions between the ruling party and the opposition, that's not necessarily a bad thing when we think about um, positioning themselves in parliament, right? So um, I think there is a role for oppositions in, in parliamentary democracies to offer some pretty trenchant critiques of the ruling government. So one potential worry about this MOU is that it's going to reduce the temperature in, in maybe non-productive ways in, in the parliament, when there are obviously some really important things for parliament to be discussing um, and considering. Um, and I think this is where maybe there's a place for bottom-up pressure, um, where 
um, you know, civil society organizations and actors, I think, have some very clear um, uh, kind of lists of reform that they have themselves. And uh, I'll mention that in a moment. But um, I think this is a place where, you know, pressure from ordinary citizens, civil society, activists, and so on can actually play a role in trying to make this a substantial thing, right? So one is to say, well, are they going to push can they push the opposition and the ruling government to actually try to implement some of these, um, some of the the reforms which are contained in this MOU? And I think some of the some of the some of the issues or bargaining chips basically within the M MOU are still very vague. You know, they talk about things like an independent judiciary, but there's no real clear sort of like act of parliament which is being suggested or. Um, you know, some some very clear sort of path forward about how these can actually be implemented. And I think that's a really uh, perhaps a useful place for opposition civil society to actually try to put some meat on the bones of these of, of these proposals. Um, and so just thinking about the beyond the MOU, um, as I mentioned before, I think, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk too much about the, the sort of long lists of institutional reforms which have been put forward, because I think civil society and maybe to a lesser extent by the Pakistan Harpan coalition itself have already come out with some very clear, sensible areas of institutional reform. And you know whether or not these specific reforms are going to be possible in the near term, given the current configuration of power, um, is another matter. But I think maybe one heartening sign is that um, you know it's not it's not as though actors are operating without a guide, uh, you know, goalposts or, or, or guidelines about what they should be fighting for. Um, and again, I think this is a, a place for especially nonpartisan civil society to, to reclaim a voice in this public sphere in actually trying to set the debate, the terms of the debate. And, you know, different groups will have different priorities about what they think is the most um, important issue facing the country. And some of these have been uh, mentioned during the MOU. Others, I think, are kind of long running issues. So things like political financing reform, which I know Ideas has been doing really interesting work on, um, local elections, an issue that has kind of perennially been put on the um, back burner, but again, is something um, when we're thinking about um, promoting things like social cohesion that, that Dr. Mahi was talking about before, I think local elections actually can play a role in doing that, or um, deliberative democracy, which was mentioned this morning, um, you know, increasing the ways in which ordinary citizens can um, can pressure governments and actually um, put some level of, of um, uh, yeah, increasing the, the, the entry points of citizens to actually try to push the issues that they care about. Um, and then finally, one other point here is that I think that so far, one other issue, which is kind of beyond the issue of institutional reform, but I think it's kind of, uh, well, maybe it's part of, partly linked to institutional reform, but I think it's things like accountability for and consequences, right? Whether they're political or legal or even social for actors who have been seen to circumvent democracy or break laws, right? So, um, you know, just thinking about the, the issue of the court cluster and, and these, these sort of ongoing corruption cases, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not involved in the, the sort of actual specific cases, but, you know, this is, it's important that there be some form of accountability for what seemed to be uh, political abuses which took place under the previous government and potentially can take place, are taking place now, um, and so on. So without thinking about particular cases, I think it's important to, to note that, um, you know, this is again an area where civil society um, and uh, political activism can play a role in actually increasing those consequences, right? So um, I think it, it's a bad sign if there is no sense of justice for any sort of issues or, or um, abuses which took place under uh, in the past several years. And, you know, again, just thinking about this topic broadly, um, by no means is, is Malaysia the only country which faces these kind of issues, right? This is a, a very common issue um, after the fall of a former uh, sort of dominant party or dominant ruling coalition. How do you hold actors accountable for what, for what they've done? Um, okay, so just to quickly conclude here. So I would say that, you know, even though Malaysia is in the midst of this transition, I think there's still very positive signs for institutional resiliency. Um, this, the, the country has moved out of the emergency period, at least with the, the framework, basic framework intact of elections, parliament, and, and so on. Um, and I think that that can be, 
uh, that can be improved upon and it can be developed over time. But I think it's, it, you know, the, the, the basic tools are there and I think they can be used by different actors um, um, in the ways that are, that are useful. And, um, you know, I think uh, when we think about institutional reforms, institutional change, this is obviously key, but it, it's only effective to the extent that political actors are compelled to actually follow those rules, right? So if, uh, you know, all the institutional reform in the world won't matter if actors are not following those rules. And again, by no means is Malaysia the only country to struggle with this issue. As a citizen of the United States, uh, this has been a huge issue in the past several years in, in US politics, right? So, um, but it's, it's just maybe important to remind ourselves that um, these actors have to be held to the, the rules that are set out by the institutions which already exist. Um, and finally, I think even though uh, you know elite national politics still dominates how we think about Malaysian politics and politics at large, we seem to be lurching from government to government and election to election. But I think it's still important to remember that um, there can be ways that, uh, uh, or there can be reforms outside of this national level which can be implemented and still make a, a significant difference in how the country will uh, will look in the next decade or two decades. So I'll, I'll just end there and I'm looking forward to the discussion later on. Thank you so much, Dr. Detman, for um, contextualizing, I think, the, uh, the situa political situation in Malaysia and drawing some uh, international comparisons, I think, which is uh, really useful when thinking about uh, where we're at now. And I'm really interested in your point about uh, the rules of the game and how do we ensure that uh, our politicians uh, compete on the, you know, we, we, with this compete um, with the same rules uh, governing everyone. And uh, I would like to come back to this during the Q&A about, because uh, I think that leads to my next question, which is then, um, how do we change the in incentive structure for our politicians, right? Because you also mentioned uh, the, um, you know, how do we get our politicians to, uh, you know, for the rule of law to apply uh, to everyone. So I think that, I think the question of incentives, I think has been key, uh, I think in, uh, you know, several years of institutional reforms uh, by civil society. So thank you so much. We'll get back to some of those points. Uh, our third and final panelist for this afternoon is Dr. Sophie Lemaire. She's a political anthropologist and consultant. She's currently an associate researcher at the Asia Research Institute at the University of Nottingham, Malaysia, and the founder and director of SOCO, a political consulting firm based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Lemer, the floor is yours. Uh, please go ahead. Hi, sorry, Hello. had some technical yes. problems. No Hi, uh, well, thanks a lot for inviting me today. Uh, thank you to my uh, fellow panelists uh, for their great uh, discussion on the on the topic um, and thanks a lot for everyone who decided to attend this kind of talk on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, you're pretty brave guys. So um, as Amrita already discussed um, this, uh, this topic from an historical point of view and Sebastian made a very good, um, uh, gave a very good few points uh, from a more political science perspective on the erosion of trust in political power and, and democratic system um, in general, uh, in, in particular, I'll be giving a more um, philosophical or anthropological perspective on the way um, we think and practice politics and, and how that relates to the erosion of trust and how we can change it. Uh, so I'll be as well talking about, you know, from a more global perspective and talking about Malaysia and a few other countries. So the first question that we want to address is, what is the er erosion of trust in political power in general and in Malaysia in particular? So we have to understand that uh, democracy is not an abstract blueprint for governance and, and it should be rooted in a national political culture. Um, such political culture or, or political behavior, if you want, uh, can th themselves be an obstacle uh, to the very process of democratization or to a sustainable um, uh, democratic practice and, and system. So numerous threats have emerged in liberal democracies, uh, including institutional rupture, manipulation of digital platform, the absence of common narrative, but um, there are two very important aspects that we should keep in mind. Uh, 
So the hostility towards uh, democratic values is not only a symptom of a global erosion of trust in political power. Um, it is, it, in fact, we can see that all type of regime, uh, liberal and illiberal democracy or semi-authoritarian system are challenged by this phenomenon. So in a global context, this may lead to power swings um, towards greater democracy, uh, like we saw back in 2018 um, in, and 2019 in Sudan, in Algeria, or in Malaysia, or it can lead to the opposite. And we saw exactly that reverse process uh, in the same countries two or three years later, Sudan, Algeria, and Malaysia with the change of government. The COVID crisis, as Sebastian explained really well, has boldened the trade of those switch towards more authoritarian practices or those reverse kind of process, uh, this democratic backsliding uh, that Sebastian explained. So in a world of, of fake news and, and true, true lies, uh, politics has become a competition of creative narrative, a competition of stories that legitimize leaders and institutions who contravene human rights and electoral rules in both democratic and non-democratic environments. So we really have to keep in mind that those kind of system processes or, or uh, twist of politics and, and, and bend of democracy, democratic rules do happen in every kind of political system, whether they're democratic or not. So it is the par paradox of legitimacy. And we, we talk a lot about this idea of legitimacy, but it, it seems that we always fail to actually uh, talk about what it is exactly. So if we take the example of Bolsonaro and Trump, um, who were or are uh, problematic, problematically perceived um, at the same time as legitimate, and illegitimate elected leaders. The consequences go beyond partisan bias and their rule bends clearly towards illiber illiberalism. Nevertheless, both were elected democratically. So what is legitimacy? Um, legitimacy is an evaluation of political power that conditions the acceptance of authority. So because we believe that a government or a leader is legitimate, then we do accept that authority. And if we don't, then we have to bear with them for a while, or we can go and, and express our opinion in the beautiful streets of Kuala Lumpur and Paris and New York and whatever. So this acceptance of authority comes from the adequation or the, the harmony um, between people's expectation and the leaders and governments. So legitimacy emerged from a complex system of interaction or exchange between the political imaginary, so the way that we perceive and think about politics, so the lens through which one would um, um, perceive politics and it, it's how the, it will influence its political behavior, and uh, political culture, political culture being the political discourse and practices, the way we practice politics. So the problem is that legitimacy can be manipulated or even fabricated through the dissemination of particular narrative and stories, leading to the people acceptance of non-democratic forms of governance, yet they would perceive those narrative, those actions and those practice as the most adequate for their country. So very often we have been talking uh, about alternative truth that was created by Donald Trump in America, but we do need to understand that for Trump supporter, this is not about alternative truths. This is reality. So there is nothing illegitimate. It's the creation of an alternative story, an alternative narrative, but it is for them exactly the way it is happening. So it is a little bit easy to just dismiss uh, those kind of discourse are just being fake news because for the people who believe in it, it's actually very true. So counter or pro-democratic narrative are numerous, but they seem to no longer echo society's expectation or answer this frustration. So when we talk about fake truths, uh, et cetera, some people will just not see it that way. Then we, we, we are just antagonizing even more those kind of people. So in order to solve the problem, we need first to understand how and why certain narrative more than others are taking root in people's minds. So what's happening um, today in Malaysia and other part of the world? 
So what we see um, is a phenomenon that we often qualify as strong men, strong men leaders. This is not this is not new. I mean, we have had strong men leaders since Napoleon and, and a few others before him. So strong men leaders are very successful at faking democracy, pretending that the country that they rule or the way they govern or the kind of um, truth they advocate for is a democratic truth. So they have hijacked democratic institution to maintain their autocratic or semi-authoritarian or illiberal rule, uh, or even to return to power when they have lost power. I define this strongman paradox as the way autocrats have reclaimed democracy and embrace, embracing what I would call a post-authoritarian neo-democratic narrative. So in a way that they would just claim that while well, democracy is there, despite the fact that we can see that the democratic values or the democratic institution of those countries have been hijacked for a political agenda or personal gain. So while at the same time, so they, they have grounded their power in a well-developed populist patronage system and a soft coercion without any significant opposition. Um, they have optimized this kind of leaders, the strong men have optimized new technology to retain power by networking popular sentiment, fabricating legitimacy, and propagating alternative realities in a highly controlled and politicized digital public square. So those new democratic narratives are anchored in a local autocratic political culture that neutralize authentic attempts of democratic reforms. The pillars of democracy, the values, processes, the outcomes are corrupted by the systematic, uh, systemic exclusion of minorities, uh, state and self-censorship, economic inequalities, electoral fraud, to name a few. In this system where alternative political realities overlap, so where you have fake, what we call fake news, alternative truths, et cetera, with another type of reality that other people perceive. So in those systems where other alternative political realities overlap, hyper-connected youth um, have inherited a very confusing political environment and very confusing political imaginary. As a consequence, they fail to engage in the public space constructively for lack of democratic knowledge, for their permeability to manipulative and polarized discourse and their fear of repression and political chaos. So for that reason, in Malaysia, for example, we have seen for many, many years, very timid kind of youth movement. And it really became much stronger uh, the past couple of years, I would say, and even more since the change of government, well, the subsequent change of government, uh, with the Lawan demonstration, um, and, and of course, before that, the Undi 18 movement and, 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 and what follows. So the last question is, what do we do to reverse the process of erosion of trust in democratic institution? Well, I think that the main thing that we must do is to innovate, to innovate in terms of democratic practice, then so that's for sure, but to innovate um, uh, the story, to change story, to invent new stories. So in the wake of this erosion of trust in political power, and in order to support and encourage the power shift called, by, called for by many citizens, it is urgent to invent and promote alternative forms of political participation and governance, along with greater civic education and, civ and dissemination of the practice and values of inclusive political and social systems. To do so, it is necessary to disseminate ideas in a way that directly connects to the deeper and subjective individual perception of politics to introduce and generalize alternatives uh, to a large audience. So in hyper-connected societies, the dissemination of political narrative is directly echoing people's imaginary, influencing political practices and the possible acceptance of authority as legitimate. In this context, a change in political culture and practices can only occur when and if accompanied by a deep connection to people's imaginary, to the way they think and the way they feel about politics in order to change their, beha their behavior. And this connection occurs only with the crafting of new narratives. So I'll stop here and hopefully we can just discuss more um, in the, during the Q&A. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lemaire. Uh, really, really fascinating uh, stuff from you. And I would uh, really like to go back to some of these points, um, especially on alternative political realities, because I think that also touches a lot with um, what Dr. Malhi also shared uh, in her uh, session earlier uh, on social cohesion and uh, you know some of these trends that we are seeing over the years. So we do have some questions from the audience, but um, I would like to uh, start with uh, my own questions first. Um, and uh, if our three speakers can just uh, turn on your cameras and then uh, we can uh, start. So uh, yeah, so let me just start with uh, Dr. Mahi, just going back to you and uh, you know, your, your sharing uh, earlier. And uh, you know, I, I did read the report that you wrote about uh, largely about the anti, there was the anti ISIT campaign and the, uh, the social cohesion model that you were uh, talking about. And, um, and maybe you can just explain a bit more about how, uh, you know, because you were then also brought in the issue of the collapse, uh, or rather the, uh, the, the uh, gradual collapse, I guess, of the middle class, especially uh, over the past uh, few years. And how, how are there links between uh, this uh, sort of, I don't want to call it conservative, but a, a, a narrative of uh, the, this fear of the other or the fear of a perceived uh, threat from the other um, with this uh, middle class collapse or the, uh, you know, the, the sort of shrinking forces of growth uh, that you have talked about. And I would, I would like to hear more about that. And because uh, I think, you know, of course, there's been so much talk about the economy um, and how COVID has affected that. But uh, it would be really great to hear how that then relates to some of these uh, fractures that also uh, you mentioned in society. Yeah, we'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, you really asked the tough questions. So you're putting me on the spot here. But also, you know, it, it gives me a chance to kind of speak historically, which is, you know, what, what I do. So in terms of what's happening now, in terms of the connection between the, you know, the, the potential collapse of the middle class and, um, you know, possibly um, a lack of progress in terms of this transition. I mean, I know, Sebastian, you talked about um, uh, a protracted transition, or I suppose the possibility that this is one, um, you know, because I'm, you know, sort of historically kind of oriented, I, I, I'm just aware of where things have totally gone astray. Like, you know, they've been completely like, they slide off the rails, right? And I know that there's a certain way of talking in political science where, you know, there are comparative models and, and there are certain, um, I guess, conclusions that are drawn from, you know, this happened there, this happened there, et cetera. But in terms of what happened in Malaysia in the past, um, you know, I can talk about, I guess, the, the Second World War and the, the last emergency, well, the big emergency, I should say, not the last one, um, because I actually have an article on this just coming out uh, next month in Itinerario. And one thing that we could say, I suppose, about that time uh, is that it was a perfect example of how economic dislocation, um, you know, conflict and just a lot of change, like a lot of change all at once and a kind of an accelerated timeline of, of social change created by the emergency how they produced and uh, were acted upon by state actors and kind of, you know, external like NGO type actors, uh, you know, uncivil society type actors, um, how they kind of contributed to a massive racialization um, and a kind of a, an, an enormous backlash against Chinese participation in politics and any idea that there can be a multiracial politics in Malaysia uh, at all. So, you know, there's a, uh, there was a whole process, I guess, of, you know, uh, war occupation, the displacement of the British, the return of the British, um, you know, and so on, that just led to, I guess, a, a massive kind of migration into the countryside by dislocated Chinese Malayans looking for ways to sustain themselves. Uh, and it was that migration into the countryside that was reversed by the creation of the new villages and the recruitment, I guess, of a largely Malay social, um, you know, force, like a kind of a community police force, as well as the, the, the more, um, you know, militarized security forces, to do some of that pushing back. So, I mean, I raise all this, not just for the, you know, the esoteric kind of uh, impact of it, but, but because I suppose it demonstrates how, you know, there can be, I guess, a lot of progress, you know, towards a multiracial ideal, let's, let's put it that way, and how that can be completely uh, reversed. And, and part of the ingredients, I guess, of, of that reversal um, include economic dislocation. I don't know if there's a pattern. Uh, I, 
as I've mentioned, you know, don't really want to speak in those terms. I prefer to do it historically. Um, and I prefer to, I guess, point out that, um, you know, all the comparative w contemporary work in the world, um, you know, it, it is not going to be able to kind of account for uh, that deep historical pattern that, that Malaya and now Malaysia have, have produced each time and the way the forces that create it operate, which is actually very similar to how they operate now, which is essentially, you know, as I mentioned, uh, to always to always racialize every potential challenge. Uh, and if that challenge uh, is exactly designed to reduce the effectiveness of racialization, it will be challenged in return, it will be pushed back upon via racialization. So, you know, there's always a lot of talk of reform, you know, I've uh, uh, I've listened to you know a lot of it over the years, and it's always excellent. The ideas are always excellent, um, but every idea can be essentially pushed off its path um, by that very effective style of campaigning. And you know sometimes it can actually embed itself and produce a kind of a mass social mobilization. Um, I'm not saying that that's where it will go because I'm not going to make any predictions. Um, but I guess I just want to say that as much as um, this protracted period of change may lead to good things, you know, some trading on reform, some progress in terms of reform, etc. It may also lead to progress for the other side, um, which is more Islamization uh, and more authoritarian, I think it's a really important thing, more authoritarian intervention in people's personal lives uh, and how they draw the boundaries between themselves and others. So for example, if you're a non-Muslim drinking Thima whiskey, you know, it's it's very easy then to kind of, you know, set you up as a sort of a, uh, you know, a, a social problem, right? And, and, and that social problem can only be reversed by more state intervention in policing the lives of everyone, uh, especially Malay Muslims, because you've got to draw the boundary. You know, if you can't, if you can't draw a boundary, you can't create a majority, you've got to have a majority for majoritarian politics to work. So it doesn't only act on people, it also produces, um, you know, that majority that, that is uh, being acted upon. So it's, it's, it's very effective. So I'll just kind of put that there as a warning, I guess. Um, and as a, a reminder that there's a certain historical pattern in Malaysia that, you, that people remember. Yeah, it's part of the social memory of the nation. Mm. Yeah, thank you, thanks. Um, you know, uh, this this discussion I think is, is really rich because uh, you know we're bringing in concepts of memory of Im the imagination uh, that Dr. Le Maire brought up which uh, I'm sure we can go uh, into as well uh, but the questions have start coming in so I, I will sort of try and uh, lump the similar ones together and then uh, direct them uh, to to our panelists for today so um, there's a question by uh, Miss Kelly fun in the uh, Q&A box, which I think is quite interesting. Um, so maybe I think Dr. Malhi can take one and then maybe Dr. Lemaire can take the other one. So for the first one, she asks about uh, the gendered impacts of fractured social cohesion in Malaysia or the collapse of the middle class. Has there been any survey of the impacts of COVID on girls and women? And how has this swung political opinion uh, among uh, amongst women actually in Malaysia? So that's that's number one. And there's a second one that I'll also take from Kelly uh, to Dr. Lemaire, where she asks, how can the strong man national leader phenomena be challenged or prevented in a country like Malaysia where society retains traditional gender roles and divisions? So the role, uh, the link between strong man leaders and also uh, gender, which is a super interesting question. And I'll just take one more, which I think is uh, good, uh, good for Dr. Detman, which is by Sarujan, Sarujini. So uh, she asked that the under, under the present governance, it seems that their existence depends on a religious party within government. What direction do you think the country is going towards moderate or conservative extreme practices? So this is Islamism in politics, and uh, maybe you could share some of uh, your opinion on that. So maybe we'll go to Dr. Lemaire first, and then Dr. Mahi, and then Dr. Dedman in that order, please. Uh, yes. Hi. Maybe. Sure. Thank you. Um, I want to address this question of uh, strong men and gender. Um, I don't know if you mentioned another question I should address, and I just I couldn't. Hear. Just that so, one. Yeah. Oh, just that one. Great. Okay. Yes, perfect. Yes. It is perfect uh, because um, okay, with the consulting firm uh, that I studied, we are currently actually working on a report um, on how to increase female participation uh, in the political system in Malaysia. So this is exactly the kind of answer and the kind of uh, 
strategy, policy strategy we're trying to develop and think about first before implementing any new thing, uh, if there is any political will. Um, so, so definitely, uh, so this is the very difficult thing is that strong men uh, are not just in Malaysia. We are seeing them in, in, in many, many other countries, uh, not in Norway, uh, but in a little bit less uh, European countries, North European countries, uh, but we do see it uh, pretty much in every part of the world. Um, so one of the main uh, tool that we do have uh, in order to kind of counter balance the or to bridge the back of uh, the, the sorry the gap of political uh, representation between uh, male, male and female is of course to um, first civic education. Civic education is a very important tool uh, that in Malaysia unfortunately is lacking tremendously. And uh, more specifically, the civic education towards uh, women and girls. And it's something that should be addressed. Um, and if not by the government, uh, by maybe state, or at least by civil society. Um, the other element is, of course, but that is more uh, a parliament, uh, a political will that is needed, is the implementation of quotas. Um, or there are different tools uh, to ensure parity. So parity, meaning that you have a balance of 50-50 between women and men uh, in representation. And it's, it is true, of course, when we talk about politics, but that should be true as well when we talk about the corporate world. Um, leadership, community leadership and leadership position for women in general is scarce in Malaysia. It is still very difficult to attain. Uh, the, the percentage of Malaysian women in the parliament and in chambers is below 15%, which means that Malaysia actually is kind of the bad the bad student for Southeast Asia. Um, it is as well below the average um, of um, uh, women representation in the Middle East. Um, and it is way below uh, the average in Latin America and in Africa. Uh, so Malaysia is definitely not doing well in terms of uh, women political representation. Uh, and again, there is a question of political will. We have seen that there were some announcements made during the PH government, a few more women were being appointed, but we have seen as well that reform where it did not lead very far. One reason is definitely the fall of the government, but the other reason is that a lot of women who are today in power position uh, do retain a lot of the um, uh, political culture uh, that is framed around patriarchal ideals um, and they have not been able to yet go beyond uh, those kind of ideals. So we do see the case where we do have women in leadership position that are not able to push for the woman agenda as much as we wish. The other factor, and I will finish here, is that those, those women in leadership position are being pressured uh, by a uh, male dominating system to retain uh, this system. And they're being pressured to not govern in a way that they would see fit and in a way that would actually um, bring us, the country towards greater inclusion of women and minorities in the political system. Thank you, Dr. Le Maire. Uh, Dr. Malhi, so a uh, question for you on the gendered impacts of fractured social cohesion in Malaysia. Yeah, okay, well, look, it's an excellent question. Thank you, Kelly, for asking the question. Um, the short answer is I don't know if there's been a, a survey of that nature, and I don't know if anybody is studying it, although if somebody would, that would be excellent. Um, I will talk, though, just quickly about how um, women, just as much as minorities, you know, Chinese or liberals, uh, can also be part of um, you know, that kind of uh, uh, scandal creation cycle that um, you know, end, ends up resulting in a certain kind of reinforcement of, of patriarchal attitudes, I guess. So, you know, uh, Ira mentioned it just now, uh, just before we started the session, that whole issue of the sanitary pad uh, packaging that was, um, I can't remember the details exactly, but there was some artwork on it that, you know, looked great actually. Um, and I think it uh, resembled a vulva or something like that. And it said something like know yourself or something along those lines on the packet. Uh, and this turned into a massive scandal because why should there be artwork that is so outrageously uh, rude and sexualized, you know, in, uh, in shops, you know, available for, for women to see. Um, and of course, the details of it are less important than, than the way it works. The way it works is to pick something, 
out of nowhere, out of thin air, you know, it can be completely innocuous, it can just be sitting there not noticed until the day comes when it is noticed. Uh, and it is deliberately publicized and is deliberately, um, you know, uh, inflamed and kind of amplified uh, by people who would benefit very much from there being a scandal around it. And so part of what happens then is a, a long discussion where the issue is in the public eye for, you know, days and days and days and days. Um, but it's done in terms of, oh my God, I'm scandalized followed by somebody who comes forward and says, why are you scandalized? You shouldn't be, this is completely normal, blah, 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 tries to walk it back. Then the initial scandalized forces, they also, yeah, they walk it back a little bit. And the outcome is ultimately everybody feels bad, everybody feels bruised. Um, and also, you know, you end up with a situation where it is now suddenly acceptable um, to kind of push the needle just a little bit further towards, you know, shutting down any kind of discussion to, towards allowing any kind of, you know, challenging artwork. Uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. and this just happens in Malaysian public life again and again and again you can see it every week um, you know whether it's Chinese people doing something you know for example being involved in politics uh, other types of minorities liberals thema whiskey you know sanitary pads you, you name it it's just again and again and again and again so you know women are material to be chewed up in that sort of process just as much as uh, minorities and liberals so I'll leave it there Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Mahi. Dr. Detman, the question on Islamism in politics. There are a few, actually. So I think you can, you can answer uh, all those uh, all at once. Yeah, please. Great, thanks. And it's an interesting question, also a very difficult one to predict, right? So, um, you know, you're, uh, the question refers to a religious party within the government, aka, I assume they're talking about PAS in this context. And I think if we're looking specifically at a party like PAS, um, I think What's interesting or, you know, interesting about PAS is that they really are a mix of ideological, true ideological belief, but also a heavy dose of political pragmatism. And I think uh, to, to some extent, I think that's true of how maybe one way to characterize um, Islamic politics in, in Malaysia in the sense that, um, you know, as we've been discussing, Amrita was just mentioning some of these issues, these kind of hot button issues which come out, I think uh, this is it's very much both a a, a sort of uh, ideological reflection or deeply of deeply held beliefs, but also being used in the most um, kind of uh, almost superficial ways to to shut down their opponents, to to sort of cut off free expression. So, you know, what direction will the future government or the current government take in terms of Islamic policies? I think it's it's really difficult to say. And I think, um, you know, one of the one potential issue is. Okay, well, if a party like PAS, which has espoused interest in things like, you know, the the uh, RU three five five and sort of the Sharia law implementation, once they're now in the position where these can actually be implemented, for political reasons, are they actually going to go through with putting forward these policies, which could be highly unpopular amongst some portion of or probably significant portions of Malaysian society, and would really change, uh, you know, Malaysia's international image and and so on. So. Um, I think there's a question of how this is used as religious rhetoric is being used for the purpose of getting votes in elections or to basically demonize opponents. And to what extent are these actually going to be reflected in, in laws and, and practices in the country? And, um, you know, I, I don't want to make any predictions about how this will turn out. But um, I, I mean, I do think there's a significant portion of Malaysian society, which um, does support at least some level of, of greater role of religion in, in politics. And um, I think that's probably, I think it's reflected in, in um, the sort of resonance of these issues um, as well, right? So on the one hand, I think um, it's often used in sort of very blatantly political ways, but clearly I think these actors are using that because they know that there's some level of sympathy and support for those ideas amongst the population. And um, how, how you think about that or combat it, if you don't agree with those, those uh, policies, I think it's both a com combination of voting, but also, you know, societal change, right? Having the voice of, you know, uh, opposing voices or counter voices be equally valid and equally accepted in the public sphere. And as, as some of you have alluded uh, previously to this, you know, it's not always the case, right? That those voices are considered um, not acceptable or shut down or, or whatever. So um, I, I don't want to make any predictions, but I think, you know, obviously, um, if for these political parties, which espouse religion uh, as, as one of their main um, sort of guiding, guiding principles, I think now that you're in power, it does create a totally different perspective than when you're on the outside, 
calling or agitating for these policies. It's very different once you're in government and uh, to the extent which you try to actually implement those principles in, in how the government and country is run. Thank you, Dr. Detman. Um, I, I would like to follow up on that question, actually, because um, I read a report uh, on the Malaysian Insight a few uh, months ago on how the uh, the conservative Malay Muslim NGO groups uh, came out saying that uh, expressed their disappointment in in uh, in past uh, being in government uh, because of the reasons that you mentioned earlier, right? So when when past comes into government, they've suddenly you know kept quiet about Sharia law, about RU three five five, about um, you know Islamic State and so on. Um, clearly, because of uh, you know, you just sort of forced to to take a more moderate position when you come into power. But these uh, conservative Malay Muslim groups have expressed uh, disappointment because you know, I guess they all of them were hoping that when PAS came into government, um, a lot of these uh, things that they've always dreamed about would then be implemented. But then they discovered to their disappointment that uh, that's not true. So um, I guess I have a follow up question, which is. Uh, now that these groups probably, you know, no longer see PAS as a reflection of their political aspirations um, to some extent, um, my fear is that what would they then turn to uh, to reflect that aspiration? Um, you know, because as much as uh, as much criticism PAS has received over the years, you know, they have still uh, they have still chosen to go through the constitutional means um, of uh, you know, democratic, parliamentary democracy and such. So um, could, you, could I get some of your comments on that? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I don't know the, the sort of Islamic civil society aspect very much, but I mean, maybe one thought about that is that, you know, historically Islamic civil society groups have played an important part in, in the process of, you know, increasing Islamization of, of political institutions in, in Malaysia. So. Um, whether or not there's sort of a new Abiyan or or a similar group which comes into which comes into play, which can then um, offer a, a platform for uh, maybe more conservative ideas about about the role of religion, or whether or not leaders emerge from that Muslim civil society, which are which are leaders who are very dedicated to these issues. I think is it's certainly a possibility, um, and you know one aspect of uh, good and bad about Malaysia's electoral system is that it tends to shut out certain parties, including new parties, right? So I don't think, uh, I think as you're saying, we're not going to see sort of the emergence of a new party, uh, even more sort of conservative than POS party, because simply there's no way for them to win under the current electoral system in Malaysia. But I think from the outside, they can definitely play a role in influencing um, the politics and, and, and uh, you know, parliamentary debates and so on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, interesting point. Uh, yes, Dr. Mahari, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to jump in um, basically by saying that, you know, look, I think Sebastian's really right on, on this important point that, you know, while outside government, parties like PAS will, will run, you know, very hard on, on certain issues. And then when, when they're in government, the whole story changes because they've got to take a, a bigger view, right? But having said that at the same time, and this is... Uh, I guess it's a kind of a compliment to what Sebastian said, is that while they're outside um, uh, government, they can do a whole lot of like indirect institutional, um, I was going to say damage, but I don't really mean damage because it's not damage in their view. Um, you know, they can make a lot of institutional change. Um, and ultimately that change can be expressed, not necessarily through the federal parliament and proposals there, but through some of the state um, governments through some of the kind of um, the Islamic bureaucracies, they can be expanded, they can be, you know, given extra powers, uh, they can be um, emboldened, I guess, to kind of, you know, go to 7-Elevens and look for bottles of alcohol and, you know, things like that, you know, the, the usual kind of material of the, of the scandal cycles that we were talking about just now. Um, and in the process of doing that, they can you know, they can really make change uh, in terms of, you know, how it, how it feels to, to live and breathe, you know, kind of uh, as, a, as a Malaysian person. Um, and there's a really good book on this. It's by Tamir Mustafa. And it's on, um, uh, I guess, activism, Islamist activism around court cases. He looked at a series of court cases, um, you know, whether they're to do with, um, you know, intermarriage and, and divorce and, you know, children, how do you deal with the children, who converts, who doesn't convert, all those sorts of questions, uh, how they are usually amplified in the media and they, they become the basis, I guess, the fodder for, you know, such, such campaigns by that whole galaxy of NGOs and, you know, people outside of government. Um, and those 
campaigns do lead to change. They bring about um, the strengthening of all these other institutions that I was talking about just now. So, you know, on the one hand, yes, you know, PAS will back down when it's got to actually live with, um, you know, other actors in, in a government. But on the other hand, there are plenty of other ways to institute change. It's like, you know, the written rules and the unwritten rules, right? We were talking about the written rules before and how, you know, players don't all play by the same rules. Well, they play by other rules and those rules are discernible if we, if we you know, look closely enough. Um, it's just that they're not the written rules. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Mahi. Yeah, I think that's, that's interesting because um, the, uh, you know, Islamism or, I don't know, Islamist politics doesn't, sort of belong to past, right? But there are so many other, the, the ecosystem is, is huge and the ecosystem, you know, penetrates uh, society uh, right down to the individual. So that that's really uh, interesting to keep in mind. Uh, Dr. Lemaire, I had a follow-up question for you from your own presentation earlier when you were talking about alternative political realities, right? And the need to innovate and invent new stories, um, which I thought was really interesting. and. What came, what came to my mind when she said that was, um, of course, there's the whole Ismail Sabri's um, Keluarga Malaysia uh, sort of narrative that he's trying to put out. And then also you see uh, Najib Tun Raza and his Bosku persona. So um, are these what you mean when you say invent, the inventing of new stories um, or narratives or imaginations uh, that our political actors want to put into people's minds? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's correct. That, that's exactly this. And, and it, Malaysia is very interesting because we, we see it very clearly, you know, uh, uh, how those new narratives are being crafted by um, uh, leaders. Uh, so we have seen, and it's, and it's the book I've been working on for a couple of years or a bit longer, um, you know, the reinvention of Mahathir. Uh, and how you know the man successfully because he was elected at the end of the, of the day uh, managed to reinvent himself from autocrat the way he was perceived by many people to an icon of democracy because he managed to successfully hijack the reformacy uh, uh, lexicon talking about human rights talking about separation of power all of those con concepts that he had for so long denied and accused of being western uh, concept and Western imports. So today we are witnessing the reinvention of Najib Razak um, and he's doing pretty well. This is not a personal opinion, this is an analysis, right? Uh, so, and, and you can see that indeed it started with Bosco, which was actually, it was a, well, we would call it an organic kind of movement as it, it was not fostered by his own communication team, uh, which has been able to foster other, initiate other kind of uh, motto and movement, but but this one came uh, from outside, um, and and Najib has been very very good at you know reinventing himself, and uh, now looking at you know the man the man of the people, uh, the one who can make you know sense of this economic disastrous situation, and indeed uh, what he says does make sense. Uh, he's doing or his team is making very long posts on Facebook that for a lot of people do make sense um, uh, about the economic reality and potential reform. Um, we have seen, uh, you know, contrary in the, in the opposite effect, how Anwar Ibrahim has been able to, uh, has lost some credibility in, within civil society and within his own supporters because he had failed at reinventing himself. Uh, and he has not been able, you know, to get over, you know, the fact that, well, you know, he kind of let, lost it, you know, in 2018, because that was the big win for Mahathir, not for him. And he lost it again, I mean, so many times when he announced that he would have the numbers. So again, another story that is a story of feeder. So it's kind of the opposite. So we can see here how easy in some way it is to build something new, to build a new story. So Mahathir built this story that was just incredible. I mean, most people, you know, in Malaysia and outside of Malaysia were saying like, well, it's never gonna work, but it did. And, and it, when we were May 10, 2018, who would have said that three years later, Najib would not be in jail and would be actually seen as the credible voices regarding economic prosperity and economic reform. So this is something that can be crafted. So it is exactly when I talk about crafting narrative, this is what I'm talking about. So then the very same strategy can be put in place to craft alternative politics, alternative 
ways of practicing politics and to, to create and foster a new political culture. So, but as of yet, I haven't seen that from any leaders currently in power. Yeah, actually, that, on, on your last point, I, I thought that was really interesting because, uh, I mean, working in civil society myself and, you know, being part of so many of these institutional reforms that, that's been uh, called for for so many years, I feel like the, the, the story or the sort of the narrative uh, that is presented by civil society on reforms, it's always then been perceive, perceived uh, to, to some extent as being elitist, right? As being yes. uh, something that only English speaking, middle, upper class yep. Malaysians will ever understand. Yep. And that's why the, and, and people then contrast that to sort of the Najib Bosku persona, mm -hmm. which resonates according to some with mm -hmm. uh, a larger section of the, of at least Malay society. Mm -hmm. So, so, how how do you then kind of overcome that struggle, right? Because what, yeah. what's needed to change is then being branded as elitist and something that people don't understand. Yeah. No, I th I think we need to make a difference between being populist and being pedagogical. Uh, so the, the the problem is so Najib is doing both. He's both populist and pedagogical. Um, and of course, he published mostly in Malay, which then you know uh, echo the largest part part of his. Uh, constituency and the largest part of, of Malaysian population. Um, so I think that yes, indeed, the problem of civil society, and I mean, we are we are this problem today. We're having this great talk uh, in English. Well, and I'm sorry I could not do it in any other language that well than my own. Um, so, uh, but but you know, we 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 maybe should have more of this kind of initiative as well um, in Malay or being translated or with subtitles or you know. Um, and and again, it's true that the lingo that the language that we're using um, this academic language or consultant language or you know um, think tank language is not fail at actually um, disseminating those kind of ideas to a wider audience. So we've been, I mean, I'm not the only one, but some academics have been trying to uh, publish books uh, uh, that actually address, you know, those kind of political issues uh, in, a, in a different way, uh, in, a, in a less jargonistic um, um, kind of um, way and publishing less jargonistic literature. But I think there is more space uh, for, for this kind of efforts. Um, and, and I think that, you know, the work that some of the young, younger organization are doing is, is very important um, in that, in translating, in addressing new people and in organizing, think differently in trying to talk about, you know, politics in a different way. Uh, the, the reason is that uh, politics is not an attractive topic anymore. Uh, so it's like, how do you talk about politics in a different way? And, and so it's, it's more about, you know, like it's, it's really not a question of substance. It's really a question of, of how you brand it because we are in a i mean we are in a world of TikTok and you know what people people of my generation and sebastian you know and i'm rita it's facebook but but now it's like TikTok and stuff and and we just need to get on board with that you know so um and i think we kind of fail at that most of the time yeah thank you thank you Dr. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't have TikTok myself, but I heard that, uh, you know, many of us use it. So, you know, yeah. perhaps I should start yeah. one. So that's um, what we need. We need icon, you know, we need influences and icon that would actually influence that debate and make it more accessible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Detman, I have a question here from Azura, which alludes to our earlier discussion about incentives, right? About how do we get our politicians to respond to the right incentives, I suppose. And because she's asking here, how do we get politicians to take responsibility for the attitudes and decisions uh, that, you know, undoubtedly has contributed to uh, how badly the pandemic was managed over the last year. And, um, you know, I, and I know that when I ask these questions in, in, in some civil, in civil society circles, the question, the, the answer is always, you know, we need to reform parliament, we need, uh, you know, more parliamentary select committees and such. But, um, I, I, you know, do you have anything, uh, uh, you, any other opinion on that? Because, you know, I think in our prior conversation as well, you know, I was asking about this, uh, how do we then strike this balance between, you know, the ongoing institutional reforms, but also, you know, maybe what voters value as well need to shift and change, uh, you know, because as a politician, obviously your greatest incentive is to be uh, re-elected in the next election, right? So um, I would like to, you know, hear some of your comments on that. Yeah. 
Thanks. Um, and uh, yeah, it's an interesting but also really difficult uh, question to answer, I think, because I, I think, um, yeah, maybe um, going on what you were just saying, Ira, I think, um, you know, we can look at it from a couple different perspectives. One is to take a very sort of institutional reform oriented perspective and say, okay, well, what are the, what are the sort of reasons that um, for example, politicians will take what we consider less than ideal decisions in whether it's COVID, whether it's governance, whether it's something else. And, you know, I think as mentioned during that presentation, we can think about things like what are the, what are sort of the, 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 the things which drive politicians um, in terms, whether it's in terms of um, how they fund their campaigns, about how their parties are organized and so on. So we can think about those kind of reforms, but I, I actually think there's a pretty important role here for um, uh, for civil society or or the the activists at large. And um, actually, maybe going on what Sophie was saying about sort of like crafting this image, I think is actually challenging some of those images which are put forward and kind of uh, they often are put forward without uh, critical uh, without criticism, right, or without um, without a substantive counter narrative that suggest, yes, this politician, whoever it is, um, clearly made a bad decision about X, and therefore we should hold them accountable, whether that means something like, you know, they're not invent invited to nice events, or they're embarrassed, or they're, uh, you know, they face some sort of consequence, whether it's electoral or political or what have you. Um, and I, I mean, I think there's there's any way, any number of ways in which politicians in the wider world are, are held to account for, for their actions. And it can be something um, consequential in terms of their political positions, or um, it can be, I think, actually so social shaming and, you know, the, the voice of a powerful counter narrative actually, I think, is really important in, 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 uh, in that process. So, um, you know, I don't have a, a, a concrete answer, but I think um, I would say we don't need to look for politicians to take responsibility themselves. I think the wider society has to um, has to force accountability or, um, or or so some some sort of repercussion for the decisions that they make and um, yeah so I would say you know I, I see in the question it's mentioning um, bringing the issues to court and police reports and you know I, I don't uh, I don't have a, a sense of what the best way forward is and I think that's a question that can only be answered uh, by by those who are on the ground and who are directly affected by these policies, right? And, and often uh, in the wider world, we see sort of organic responses to politicians who do bad things, right? Or make poor decisions. And that can be electoral, it can be um, you know, societal, it can be a protest movement. So um, I don't think there's one answer for that, for that question. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I agree that you know, it, there's, it, it's so multi-layered, right? Because if you look at, uh, what's happened, I think, over the last year where, uh, I, don't, I think everyone remembers that uh, press conference that was given by uh, uh, the chairman of Prasarana after the LRT crash, uh, where, you know, he was being very insensitive to the victims. And then, you know, there was a big uproar on social media about it. Um, and, you know, people are questioning why is it that a, a person like this can be appointed as chairman of Prasarana? Um, you know, but the truth is, uh, you know, our electoral system, Malaysia's electoral system is such that, uh, you know, as long as the people in your constituency vote vote for you, keep voting for you over, you know, decades, um, you know, it, it is very difficult for sort of, you know, public condemnation such as that to then uh, remove or topple, uh, topple leaders. So, and, and there are reasons why uh, these, these kinds of politicians are keep being re-elected over so many election cycles because they have managed to maintain that uh, that the clientelist relationship with their uh, constituents and um, you know manage to satisfy uh, the, the needs of their constituents for uh, you know several decades uh, and you know with um, you know with being an MP then because of the lack of institutional independence and such, uh, you can then be appointed to GLCs and you know and you hold uh, you wield a, a you know very very strong uh, power once you're in that position. So it, it reinforced keeps reinforcing itself, right? Because uh, you know you you have 
you know, politics is run by money and then you are, you know, able to then sort of dish these things out to your constituents, they keep voting for you. And then when you're in these positions, you then get appointed to, uh, you then get rewards by being appointed to boards and chairmanships of GLCs and such. So, uh, yeah, it is complex and it is multi-layered. Um, Dr. Mahi, uh, actually, we will can probably end a bit earlier today, but I do want to go back to you on, there's a question by uh, Hop on Ku here, which I think is quite interesting. So um, with the growing race and religious conservatism in uh, government, or at least the appeal to it by political parties, what do you think that will the reaction be from liberal leaning CSOs and parties and how can they find appeal? And this is related as well to my earlier question for Dr. Le Maire, you know, which is um, looking at the sanitary pad and the, um, you know, whiskey question and how, like my, I've always felt that, you know, the groups that uh, believe in these things respond very, very quickly to issues such as, this, such as this and, you know, come up with very, very fast, coordinated, inflammatory sort of responses. And this so-called liberal progressive side, uh, you know, does not, you know, we're always playing catch up. So, you know, my question to you is how do we then, uh, you know, get that, in, I don't know, how, how, how does that then impact towards um, advocating for this more, you know, moderate uh, politics, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Um, and I, I noticed that there is some attempt uh, being made. And there's two things I'd like to just specifically draw attention to. One is that, you know, Najib's campaign is not just Bosco, it's also that he rides a motorbike and he works out at the gym. I think this is very interesting, this whole gym thing, because, you know, he is on Instagram and Facebook and whatnot, you know, with his head poking up from under the bench press and stuff like that. And if you look closely, you see it's actually a Smith machine. Uh, and he's actually not holding it up by himself sometimes. Um, but it doesn't matter because that's not the way to react, right? So what 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 people are doing in response is so for example, you know, you see Anwar uh, planking outside the front of his house. So there is a bloody, you know, fitness competition going on between these leaders, all of whom are, you know, of a certain age, none of whom are young. Um, and it doesn't matter because, you know, if you can show that you do the things that young people do, um, like, you know, go and work out at Anytime Fitness and try and kind of, you know, build yourself up and, and ride your motorbike and, and look cool. Well, there's a certain constituency that is into that. Um, and then at the same time, you know, you see this this other kind of counterpoint, which is the, the Muslim groups. You know, so for example, Abim has been investing a bit in, you know, a cosmopolitan Islam in a kind of a Bangsa Malaysia, um, you know, campaign. Uh, and, you know, you can see quite clearly that it's designed to be a counterpoint to some of the, you know, the, the Islamist groups and how they try and kind of, you know, mobilize and, and weaponize, um, you know, um, race and religion, right? So they, you know, it's an attempt to create a counter mobilization. The thing is, though, if I can be so blunt, um, the plank doesn't beat the bench press uh, and the cosmopolitan campaign doesn't beat the effectiveness of the of the racial and religious outbidding. So, you know, I mean, there's a part of me that wants to encourage, I guess, more clever um, and more uh, kind of agenda setting interventions. Um, but there's also another part of me that is, I guess, realistic um, in the sense that, you know, it's obvious that these other groups, they don't have the resources of federal government, you know, because some of the NGOs, they're actually quasi NGOs, aren't they? They're actually, you know, full of UMNO members and full of past members and whatnot. They're not really NGOs. Um, so they have, you know, all kinds of resources fed to them. Um, and they also have, I guess, a certain kind of authority, uh, because they can lean on the fact that they're actually UMNO division branch leaders, um, you know, and that kind of thing, right? So this is this kind of um, involvement, I guess, of the of the parties and the NGOs that that creates a certain well funded, well resourced, uh, ecosystem uh, that, the, that the liberal side doesn't really have. Um, it's got some money too. I don't want to pretend it's got none. It's got some money too. It's got some resources, but it just doesn't seem to be able to kind of break through. Um, partly because it's it's not going to the gym. It needs to go to the gym. The liberal side has got to work out. Uh, and then there's also, I guess, just a, a certain kind of you know connecting that that the the you know the liberal civil society side needs to attempt to do. Part of that, I guess, can be speaking in Malay. But you know, let's be honest. Most people in Malaysia are Malay. So most people on the liberal side are able to speak Malay just fine. Um, but they don't speak Malay because they got to participate in kind of international conversations. And that can also be their weakness because then the, the non-liberal side can say, hey, you guys, you're foreign funded. You know, you're just spouting these liberal talking points from the US and all this kind of thing. So every option that anyone might take in this scenario has got a certain pattern 
has got a certain kind of history, a deep history in Malaysian social life. Um, and uh, nothing is guaranteed to work. So, you know, even if they increase their their bench press, they, they just may not be able to cut through because that territory is already taken. So, you know, it's a complicated one and I don't exactly know the answer, but I do, I would like to see, I guess, a more competitive attitude in the first place. And maybe that's a good start. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahi. Wow. I think um, in the next, my, my next meeting with our CSO partners, I'll tell everyone that we need to, um, you know, film ourselves going to the gym. Uh, the other thing I noticed about uh, Anwar is also... <laughs> The other thing I noticed about Anwar is also the, the gardening, you know, it's doing a lot of gardening as well, which is quite interesting. Um, okay, so uh, actually we're done with the questions. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to all three panelists uh, in reverse order to actually, um, you know, some uh, tie up any loose ends that, you know, we didn't get to earlier and also some concluding remarks uh, before I just end uh, this panel session. So let's go with Dr. Lemay first and then Dr. Batman and Dr. Mali in that order. Dr. Lemay, yes, you need to unmute yourself, sorry. There um, you go. Okay, concluding remarks. Um, actually, I'm, I'm, I was uh, entertained by what Amrita just said, you know, about the bench press, bench press et cetera. Um, and, and, and of course, you know, the idea is always to build the story and to make sure that they look younger than Mahathir, which is not a very big challenge, that they're very healthy despite their age and they can go on forever like the old man. And, and so it, it is interesting and it is true that it's work, it works much better for Najib uh, than Anwar, but because they just don't have the same audience. So while Najib does have this very wide, uh, very uh, large uh, audience of young Malay guys, um, um, Anwar failed to have them, uh, so so it is it is quite interesting. The the overlapping as well of of civil society and political parties is something. Well, I've been working for my PhD, so uh, it is interesting to see that it's continuously uh, being a very big part of the game. Uh, and we we don't have a lot of very independent civil society here. Uh, civil society is highly politicized, uh, and we see that without the support or the collaboration with political parties, we don't have reform, we don't have things happening. I think UNDI 18 maybe might be one of the more independent, but we've seen that, you know, MUDA members coming in as well, uh, they get a lot of support from DAP, which, which is not a problem, but this is there is no such thing as very independent civil society. So uh, I see that a lot of NGOs are indeed the arms of political parties. Um, so I think that indeed we need new ideas, uh, new narratives, uh, new language, uh, that's for sure, um, and, and, and doing much more, much more uh, in Malay and to addressing again the use is something I think very important and that we should all work on. Thank you, Dr. Lemaire. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Detman. Uh, so yeah, I would actually just echo some of Sophie's points there. I think, um, you know, as someone who political scientists tend to focus a lot on sort of the formal institutions and and you know national level institutions, but um, I, I I would agree that I think you know opposition parties and and parties as a whole should not be calling the shots and framing the debate about how reform looks because the, as actors as political actors political parties and political leaders and so on have very different incentives than ordinary people. So um, I think to some extent, if we have a more, if Malaysia has rather a more independent civil society in the way that Sophie was just referring to, I think that's a very positive sign because then it suggests that um, it's not not entirely hanging on the, the whims of the political class basically to either implement or not implement certain reforms. And um, that being said, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, organizations like Ideas and, and sort of the larger, um, you know, civil society uh, organizations have already articulated a number of very clear pr proposals for reform. So I think the question, and maybe just reflecting on what we've just discussed, I think the larger question is like, okay, how do we go from here? How does the, how are some of these things implemented? And how are sort of worse fates avoided in terms of um, the, the democratic progression of the country? So um, yeah, not a lot of like, there's not, there's no one way to do it, but I think a lot of what we discussed, I think offers some helpful ways uh, forward. And I, I don't think it can be purely a society based or bottom up process, but neither should it be entirely a top down or political elite driven process of, of reform and change. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mahi. 
Yeah, look, uh, thank you. Um, I, I just uh, I just had another just reflection quickly on um, this issue of what language should these competitive actors try and speak in. And yeah, sure, you know, everybody on the liberal side actually knows how to speak Malay. And equally, everybody on the conservative side actually knows how to speak English. Um, political actors, yeah, they're, they're pretty adaptive, like they, they know what to do. But the thing is that they are speaking to a base and they are speaking to, um, uh, I guess, a speaking to a constituency that wants things framed in certain ways. And part of the reason for that is that they have kind of almost been set in through some of the, you know, the impacts of the types of campaigns that have happened in the past. So, you know, when I mentioned that that book by Tamar Mustafa that talks about how, you know, each time there is a new kind of campaign like this, um, there is some level of institutional change, you know, that, that actually occurs. Um, so that, you know, the Islamist campaigns are actually very effective. They, they do produce change. Uh, and on the liberal side, it's just not quite the same, except there is this kind of, this carving of these two separate grooves. That is essentially the main, um, you know, outcome of, of these kind of um, bifurcated civil society campaigns. Um, and that groove is actually already carved. Like it is not so straightforward to, you know, get into the other one and try and compete on that territory. Um, and equally, you know, for conservatives, it is not so straightforward to get into this one and, and compete on this territory. Like it, it's actually quite a complicated process because of all that history. Uh, and so, you know, I wonder if, you know, attempting to compete on the other people's terms all that's going to do is just say, you know, cause them to say, oh, well, look, that just shows, you know, you haven't got anything, you haven't got anything useful or new to do, you know, because you're just coming onto our territory and that proves your weakness. Um, so I don't know, I actually am going to be completely straight with you. I don't know if that's going to work because, you know, once you try and sort of tread on those other people's toes, it's just really obvious, you know, that, that you've kind of, you've, you've lost it. You don't have any, um, you know, uh, momentum of your own. So I think the question for me is how is momentum produced uh, that can actually start to bridge, uh, you know, that, that so-called divide. I, I don't like to call it a divide. I think that's too uh, formal uh, because it's actually very flexible in kind of real life, even if not in institutional terms, even if not in political terms. Um, but how do, I guess, how do actors make use of that flexibility under the surface? I think that's interesting. And I don't know the answer, um, but I don't know that it's going to be created by you know, going to the villages, <laughs> which is what the point the liberals are always told to do. And in the yes. end, people who vote in villages actually live in Shia Lam, right? So, yes, you know. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that, that, that's really interesting. Very interesting reflections from all three uh, panelists. Um, you know, coming from my own experience, uh, you know, I, I, I sit with many other friends from civil society. And, and Dr. Mali, you are absolutely right. Like, you know, the, the suggestion is always like, we need to speak more Malay or like, we need to go to the kampong. And it's like, well, you know, how many Malays, you know, how many Malays do you know actually, you know, live, live in the kampong and can't speak English, right? So, um, you know, so, so these kinds of generalizations are also uh, problematic in themselves. So, yeah, so thank you so much to all three panelists uh, for this really wonderful uh, session today. Um, yeah, actually we finished in good time. And, uh, you know, I've been uh, really, really privileged to be able to uh, be moderated for this uh, session. And I think we've managed to cover uh, many, many interesting uh, topics. And each of our three speakers brought, um, I guess, very unique perspectives. Um, Dr. Mali with, um, you know, social cohesion and uh, growth and, you know, or, or rather lack of, um, Dr. Detman with, uh, you know, bringing in a more, uh, you know, setting Malaysia's situation in, in context, uh, you know, within uh, the sort of erosion of trust uh, going on around the world. And then Dr. Lemaire coming in with uh, the question of legitimacy, strongman leaders, and also political, uh, alternative political realities, which I thought was uh, really fascinating. So really great uh, in-depth discussion today. So thank you so much to all our um, audience for tuning in both on Zoom and also on Facebook. Um, I'll just go through uh, the two sessions tomorrow. So we'll have the um, uh, second panel session tomorrow on the rise of state intervention in weathering the economics of COVID-19. That's happening at 10 a.m. Uh, we will have Hafiz Nur Shams, Inta Nadia Jalil and Dr. Carmelo Ferlito for that session. And then the third panel session at 2 p.m. tomorrow on Sunday, on uh, vaccination, balancing personal liberty and community interests with Dr. Hartini Zainuddin, Dr. Kaur Sri Keng, and also uh, Prof. Adiba Kamaru Zaman. So that's happening tomorrow. Uh, 
you can tune in on uh, our Facebook page, IDIS Facebook page as well, if you didn't have time to register for Zoom. So thank you so much um, to the three panelists. Um, I would just request you. you to stay on for a while uh, after we are done, uh, just for a short uh, briefing. And I think that's all from me today. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Uh, good afternoon evening to everyone and uh have a nice weekend so thank you very much um yeah thank so you for i think no worries thank you. thank you so much thank you uh yeah so i think it's kind of will just uh, end the live stream now <laughs>